tonight. You all right, guy? You okay? I'm fine. It's fine. Um, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. So tonight, folks, we are going to conclude our study of Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, my apologies, because we were supposed to conclude it well before, but because of different uh, um, events that keep coming around. Good evening, Linda. No. Um, different events, different appointments, wasn't able to do it before the, the previous course started, which was the prayer course, the unanswered prayer course, which I'm sure you were blessed by as well, those of you that participated. It was a very, very good, good course. And then of course from next week, so what's going to happen now is we will, we will have the prayer meeting once a month, right? So it just gives us uh, uh, more of a chance to, to continue the studies. So we have three three Sundays in the month doing the Bible study, and then the last Sunday in the month, for example, will be the prayer evening. So we'll hopefully get through a lot of material quicker. We'll, we'll, we'll see because we are going to embark on a, on a new journey from next week. Here we go. It could be a long journey. Yeah. We're going to go through the Gospel of Matthew. Ooh. Ooh. We're going through the Gospel of Matthew, so I just invite you, you know, to, to encourage others to come along as well. Obviously, Jesus is at the very centre of it, but it also is going to give you a better understanding, I think, of, of, of God's wider plan. His plan of salvation for the nations and his plan for Israel and so on. So please make every effort to come along to that. And yes, I am using my lenses tonight, look, to facilitate reading. To get, yeah, I've given him, praise God. Amen. Let's just have a word of prayer before we get started. So Father, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for your goodness, thank you for your grace, thank you for the freedom that we have to come publicly and study the Word of God. Lord, and uh, we just pray tonight again as we're just, we're just concluding, Lord, this letter, this awesome letter, help us to remember the things that we've learned over the months that we've studied, help us to hear Paul's heart, Lord, help us to understand your plan for your people. In a deeper way, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. So it's been quite a while, hasn't it, since the last time we, we were together. I think it was, was it December when we were studying last. It was, wasn't it? So can you believe we're in April? Ooh. That's shocking, actually. Where's that gone? We did January the 14th. Oh, we did January the 14th. Okay. We managed to squeeze, squeeze one in January. We squeezed one in January. Good. Just a quick reminder of, of where we're at. Later, if we have the time, I hope we will have the time, um, we're just going to do like a, a bit of a review, an overview, very brief, about some of the themes that we've looked at through the letter. But tonight, um, let's begin just by reading from verses 22 to the end of the chapter of, of chapter 15. 22 through to the end of the chapter. We're going to be focusing on chapter 16, but just to, as a recap. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come to you, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey, and to be helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of the spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I shall go by way of you to Spain. 
But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Okay, so you can deduce from this passage that Paul had a desire to visit Spain. Spain. <laughs> a bit like horse lot as well, isn't it? You <laughs> tend, to, tend to like Spain. <laughs> Early <Yeah. laughs> Second home. <laughs> Second home. Praise God. And so obviously he was going there. Of course, you go there with the same motives, right? To, to take the gospel of Christ <laughs> to those lovely Spanish people. Um, <laughs> So that was Paul's, Paul's plan, was to go to Spain via Rome. And he was hoping that the church in Rome would help him to prepare, obviously financially and through other means, prepare him to go on to Spain. So Paul speaks of his plans to visit the church in Rome in preparation for taking the gospel on to Spain. He expects the Roman church to support him in his endeavour to reach Spain. Uh, that should be first. First, uh, he's visiting Jerusalem with the gifts taken up in the churches of Macedonia and Achaia, Gentile churches for the church of Jerusalem Jews. Remember, we've kind of seen this throughout the letter, haven't we? This, this relationship, this new relationship in the church between Jew and Gentile. You know, it was revolutionary. That was what was revolutionary in the New Testament. It wasn't just that the Messiah of Israel had died. You know, and been resurrected, praise God. It was the, the, the implications of that for the church. God was, was bringing together Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. That was, that was revolutionary for them. For the Jews had a hard time to understand that. And you can see that as you read through the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. You know, it causes a big debate. And uh, you see there's a lot of people that just couldn't accept that and... Paul has to write to the Galatian churches because there's Jews that won't accept that. So it was a big thing. It was a big thing. But obviously those who did believe, uh, Paul had taken the gospel out to the Gentiles. Remember this man who was a Pharisee of the Pharisees who was extremely zealous and had this encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus completely changed his life. And uh, he, he ultimately, although he went to the Jew first, he ultimately became the apostle to the Gentiles and uh, reaped a great harvest among, amongst the Gentiles. And uh, we've seen as we've looked through Romans chapter 11 and so on, we see how, how, what great lengths he went to to make sure that the Gentiles didn't become arrogant and boastful against the Jews. Both the Christian, the Jewish Christians obviously, but the, the Jews who did not believe. Because the tendency, as it has been, you know, throughout Christian history at many, many points. Oh, I need to plug in my things, it's going to go off otherwise. Just a minute, guys. Little detail, I forgot. The tendency was to, was to think. <coughs> yeah. That God had finished with the Jews. <laughs> You know, um, and so that's something that Paul addressed, that the, the Gentiles, Christians, you and I, as the church became predominantly more Gentile, didn't boast, didn't get arrogant about it. And we, how we need that message today, you know, because you've got a whole line of, of reasoning and thinking that, that you know, the church is, is the new Israel and, and God has finished with the Jews and so on. I don't see that in Scripture. I see the contrary. Actually, I see warnings for the church against thinking that way. Well, here we say, we see that you know he's making it clear that that spiritually the Gentile churches have received have been blessed by the Jews. Why? Because the apostles were Jews. You know, it was the Jews that took out the, 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 the gospel to the Gentile nation, so they've been blessed spiritually. So now is their opportunity to bless the Christian Jews, okay? So the, the, the Gentile Christians all across Macedonia and, and Achaia, 
He takes up an offering for them because the Christian Jews in Jerusalem were going through a hard time. And so you can see he's always working to build that relationship, isn't he? And, and to, to kind of sort out any division within the church. So he wants to go to Spain. There is no evidence, scriptural evidence, to say that he went to Spain. Okay? But there are church historians, there, there are far, some, one of the fathers, I think it was, that said that Paul, when he gets to, eventually gets to Rome, that he's... He's, he rents accommodation in Rome and then he's, he's able to go to Spain for a time before coming back to Rome and then going through the, the persecution under Nero. It's questionable. But you can see at least he had the intention of taking the, the gospel to Spain via Rome. He does, of course, end up in Rome and he, he ends his days in Rome under the Neronic persecution. Do you remember when Nero blamed the Christians for burning a part of Rome? Right? Really, because Nero wanted to, to, to put a building project in place and needed some things moving. And then there was this mysterious fire that the Christians started. And uh, yes, so anyway, Paul, he was, he was persecuted and he was executed and beheaded during that particular time. Anyway, let's move forward, if we can. So, moving into tonight's passage, Romans chapter 16, um, yes, we'll read, I'm going to read the whole thing, alright. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Cape Freya, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed she has been a helper of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epenetus, Epenetus who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who laboured much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ. And Stachys, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are of the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Wow. Greet Trephina and Trephosa, who have laboured in the Lord. Greet the beloved Perses, who, be who laboured much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asincritus, as in, as in Phlegion, Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus and Julia, Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ reach you. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those, are such to, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and fat, flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, Sosipater, and my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host, and the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. And Quartus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, 
To God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Wow. I do apologize for my pronunciation of those names. Some of them very difficult. What is this? Somebody's calling on his wife. Complete stranger. I'm glad you didn't Okay. Anyway, so you, you would look at that and you think, what on earth, what relevance does that have to us? All these names, all these... Well, number one, you know, these were people. These were real people like you and me. Praise God. Praise God. It just makes, I don't know, it just makes it a bit more personal, doesn't it? You know, you've been reading all about the, the doctrines and theology and all of this, and then suddenly he starts to just throw some names about you know, these are real people who were there at the time, and um, praise God, they were in Rome. Anyway, so whilst Paul sends greetings to people in the conclusion of his other letters, he never elsewhere comes close to greeting as many as he does here. He takes his time to name names here. Why? First, Paul has never been to Rome. The people he mentions are ones he has met on his missionary journeys throughout the eastern Mediterranean. How so? Do you remember right at the beginning when we talked about some of the historical context of the letter? You remember that? <laughs> no. Do you remember some of the Jews had been expelled? All the Jews had been expelled from Rome in about AD 49. There was a big debate, and it was probably, according to, to Roman historian, it was over the, the, the subject of Christus, which surely was Christ. Do you know? So it could have been at the time that you've got the, the non-believing Jews and the believing Jews arguing, you know, over, the, over Christ. And there was uh, disruption in Rome to the point that Claudius expels all the Jews from Rome. Priscilla and Aquila, remember, remember them in the facts? I think it was in Corinth where he, he, he uh, encountered them. So there you go. They're back in Rome now, right? So later on, that edict was rescinded and they were allowed to come back to Rome. So these were people who were like dispersed from Rome across the Mediterranean world for different reasons, different places, obviously. So Paul met these people at different points on his journeys. Remember, we're reading, what, 28, 28 chapters of the book of Acts. But we're talking years, right? And you imagine the, the, the different places that, were, that, that he visited, the different people that he met. We only get like a snippet of information, don't we, in, in every place. But the people that you met en route, think of all the people you've met over the years, you know, in, in churches and, and so on. So he wants to really just show them that he knows a lot of the people that are associated with the Church of Rome. Okay. Secondly, so Paul wants to establish common ground with the Church. Though he did not plant the church, nor had he ever visited the church, there were many who knew and trusted him there. Um, you remember there was a lot of, in the beginning especially, remember when Paul set out originally, Saul of Tarsus, and by the way Paul, it wasn't that he had a name change, alright, some people wrongly say that you know Paul had such a change on, his, on the Damascus road that they changed his name to Paul. Now, Saul, or Shaul, was his Hebrew name. Paulus was his Roman name. That was it. Okay? So, yeah, it's a common error. It's a common error. So, he was transformed, but his name wasn't changed. All right? One, you've got Hebrew, his name. He was a Roman citizen. So, Paulus was his Roman name. Shaul was his Hebrew name. Okay? That stirred a bit there. <laughs> Ruffled a few feathers, hadn't it, didn't it? I've got the biggest one. <laughs> there you go. I'm not charging extra for that. I think the sky was just blue. Praise God, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> now, um, I was going to say, so obviously when he first converted, you know, it took the church time to, to kind of like, has he really converted to this fella here? You know? So there was a lot of suspicion about him in, in the beginning, but obviously he proved his, he proved his, his conversion. Um, I wonder you know, how much that haunted him throughout his, 
his travels, um, when it got hard and so on, when it, you think back to the things that he did as he persecuted the church and kind of drive him on even more to serve the Lord with even more fervor. Was that the Archie Constantine or that? Um, that was, let me see. I don't, yes, that's the arch. Oh no, that's the arch of Titus. Titus. Yeah, because it's got the. You see all the inscriptions on the inside. Yeah. It's got the. Um, the when they destroyed the Jerusalem temple, they took all the furnishings away from the temple. So it's on the arch of Titus. So that's in the Roman well the forum the area the forum. Okay. So, what can we learn from this, this, this list of names of people? Well, there's a lot to learn, actually. It tells a lot about the church, number one. Well, it tells us about the diversity of the Roman church. What did a Roman church look like? What did the church look like in the first century? Remember, these, these churches that were springing up all across the Mediterranean world, they're in the Roman world. It was in the Roman Empire. Okay, whether it be in Asia Minor, which is the region of Turkey, whether it be a crossing to Europe, it was all part of the Roman Empire. So, obviously, Roman society is very important to try and understand Roman society, different social classes, and so on, because that was the church. The church were made up of these different social classes. Anyway, the names are diverse in the letter and reveal much about the individual, for example, the origin, the profession, and the social class. So we see there are Jewish names that are mentioned, for example, Priscilla and Aquila, <coughs> verse 3, Andro Andronicus or Andronicus and Junia, I'll come back to that name later, verse 7, and Herodian, verse 11. However, most are Gentile names, for example, Hermes, you've heard of Hermes, haven't you before? Hermes and Olympus. We think straight away about Mount Olympus, don't we, in the Greek, Greek theology, the Greek uh, mythology. Greek mythology. So I guess it was the, the dumb thing to name your children after Greek gods or heroes or whatever, you know. Many of them appear to be freed men. Alright? So, freed men, so that, that was a certain social class within Roman society. So they were men, <laughs> they were people who were freed. Freed from what? Slavery. Slavery. Okay? from slavery. They were called the Liberty. They're made up of those released from slavery. Um, so there were different ways that somebody could be released from slavery. You've got to think, when the, when the New Testament speaks about slavery, have you noticed that Paul doesn't necessarily come out and say, well, it's all wrong and it shouldn't be going on and so on and so forth, right? Have you seen that in the New Testament? Even though it's morally wrong, we've got to understand that slavery in the Roman world was different to like slavery that we've known in more modern times. Okay, um, so so slavery was was very much accepted within that world, and many people they they become indebted to someone, for example, and they could pay that debt by becoming a slave. Many of the slaves they were people who were um, they were the, the, the pleb society. You know, the plebs. I know that sounds bad. All right, but we, I would probably be that as well, and you as well, in, in that world. Because we weren't really necessarily rich or somebody of, of great status. I know it's, it's quite derogatory today, isn't it? Call somebody a plebe, get a slap. You know, but that's what it was in that, in that world. But anyway, so, so the slaves, sorry, the slaves, the simple class, they, they would, um, very often, <coughs> they would join themselves to a master, they'd be indebted to somebody, they'd pay their slavery, but also, you know, when it talks about household, you'd have somebody of status with slaves. The slaves would work alongside their master. They'd learn the trades of the master, and they'd even maybe run businesses. You'd have different hi a hierarchy within slavery as well. You'd have some slaves who were over other slaves, and so on. You know, so it was just it was an accepted social class. That was the, that's the way it was. Um, so. Yes, so some people, you could work 10 to 20 years and then the master would free you. 
legally. It would make you a freed man. You were once a slave, but you'd been freed. So there were different ways that a, a person could achieve this, this status of being a freedman. All right? Anyway, we know there is a social class within the church. I do want to just point out, though, and we see this, Paul makes this very clear, especially in Galatians, and he just says, you know, there's no male or female. There's no slave or free. Remember that? No Jew or Gentile in Christ Jesus. You're all one. So whatever you were outside within society, when you came together as church, all of those social categories were to be put aside. And everybody was to be treated equally. Okay? Now you see, <coughs> later you'll see uh, uh, Paul, and he, he, he instructs slaves to, to, to submit to their masters. Do you know? And, and to treat them, work them as if they were working for the Lord, for example. All right? uh, but he also treats masters to treat their slaves with dignity and so on. Anyway, that's for another, another night. So we've got different people who have been freed and been released from slavery uh, through different means. Some continued as slaves to belong to a household of someone. Usually that's what it means when it's greeting a household. He's also including the slaves of the household. Uh, usually meant to be a slave of that person. Okay? So somebody belonging to a household of someone usually meant to be a slave of that person. For example, Aristobulus and Narcissus. Okay. Women. Women. Not women. <laughs> women. Women were prominent in the Roman church. Women were prominent in the Roman church. Now, if you wanna if you wanna have some controversy, throw out this this question about women in ministry. <laughs> If you want to hear some, some strong arguments, you know, mm -hmm. organise a debate about women in ministry, what women <coughs> should do and shouldn't do within the church. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what do we see? Mm -hmm. Number one, they're prominent not just as attenders, but workers. Verse one, what he says here. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Cancrea, that's near Corinth, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and a sister in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed she has, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Praise God. She's a servant. She's described as a servant in the church. Now this goes more so into the second, I think, the next one. Yes. So just I'm jumping ahead a little bit. By saying she was a servant of the church, you know, you've heard of the word diakonos. It's where we get the word deacon from. We talk about deacon. And diakonos simply means a servant. Regardless of what it might mean now in certain church denominations, all it meant in that world was a servant. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> wonderful. A servant. Which actually all of us are to be jackanos, aren't we? Really? We're all to serve firm, first and foremost. Alright, so it's very likely that she was a deacon within the church, a recognized deacon. Rather than just being a servant, of course a deacon is a servant, but it was also obviously a position within the church. Okay, so these were uh, Delegating, designated people who were maybe to look after, you know, visit the sick and things like that and support uh, uh, people who needed material help and so on. So they had that kind of responsibility within the church. So she was a, she, she was a deacon within the church. All right? So more than one third of those Paul greets are women. Good. Phoebe. Priscilla, Junius, Tryphena, and Tryphosa. And Persis are specifically commended. They're specifically commended. So we can see, you know, just as we see today in our churches, that women have a prominent role. They're the ones usually that's the first ones to get stuck in. You know, I'm sorry, 
men. It's the truth. They're the first ones, you know, to get in the kitchen and sort of thing. <laughs> no, but yes, moving on, swiftly moving on. They, uh, they were obviously, you know, they were very active within the early church as well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Phoebe was described as a great help to Paul. Maybe indicating that she, she supported him financially. You know, there would have been those, there was, um, what was her name? Lydia. In Philippi, was it? Mm -hmm. Goodness me. Come on, Rob. Yeah. I think it was. Yeah. And I think she had her own business. You know, and people like that were able to support these people, the apostles, as they were out itinerant ministers of the word of God. Andronicus or Andronicus and Junia, okay, are possibly a husband and wife team. So let's let's just keep reading that little part there, because that's important. It's all important, of course, but he goes on to say here, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Verse 3, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Where, where were they meeting? In the house. In the house. There you go. Bless the Lord. I'm not going to talk about all these other names, because I'll get myself into all kinds of troubles again. Verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia. My countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Alright, so this is obviously one we need to stop and have a think about. So they are described as apostles. Apostles. Alright? And yet we need to be careful not to, not to think that they're apostles in the same way as Peter was an apostle. Or, or Paul was an apostle, or John was an apostle, and so on. Okay? Apostolos. Apostolos is the Greek word. An apostolos. Anybody know what apostolos means? You must have heard of it many times. Any ideas what it means? It means a sent one. You've heard that before, haven't you? Yeah. A sent one. To be sent. Now, why am I raising this? Because. There's a lot of, I've said to you before, there's a lot of um, debate about what women can and can't do in the church. What positions women should and shouldn't have within the church. And you know, there, there basically there are two, there are two camps that you, you kind of land in. Right? <laughs> one is called egalitarian, and one is called complementarian. Okay, so egalitarian will basically say that there's no distinction between the male and female within ministry. Everything that men can do, women can do. Complementarian will say no. <laughs> no, the man is the head of the woman and then the woman is not to have a place of authority over the man and also and so on. All right? and I know some of you are looking at me already. <laughs> there's arms being folded and all sorts. Goodness me. So part of this... Part of the, the argument that's put forward by the egalitarians is that actually Junia was an apostle. Junia was an apostle. Okay? So, therefore, women can be apostles. There's actually a little bit of debate about whether it's Junior or Junius. One can be a male, one, or not, the other can be the female name, alright? There's some debate around that. But the big, the big question is, you know, if, if it is Junior, and I think it is Junior, I think it is a woman. What? She's called an apostle. And so women can be apostles. Alright? You've been waiting for me to give me my, my, uh, my verdict, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Well, all I would say is just, just remember what apostle means. It means a sent one. Yeah. Alright, that's it. What we have made it nowadays, and I've, I've got some real problems with this. We have made the, 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 the title apostle something in our day that I don't believe it should be. Mm -hmm. All right? For me, what's happening, what's going wrong with the modern church, and there's a movement, we call it the New Apostolic Reformation. You'll hear about it eventually if you're not already. 
down already. And it's the idea that God in these last days, the church has got it wrong for so long, you know, missed this for so long. But in these last days, God's raising up apostles and prophets. Again, governing positions of apostles. So when they say apostles, they're not talking about apostolic ministry, okay, like Ephesians 4, mm -hmm. uh, which, are, which are apostles, prophets, evangelists, mm -hmm. pastors, teachers, yeah. right? Fivefold ministry, you've all heard of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Ministries. To build up the body of Christ, that's it, okay? So my idea of an apostle is somebody who will go and pioneer a work, Maybe start a new church in a region where they haven't got one or whatever. They pioneer the work, they establish everything, they, 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 they help to establish the leadership, and then they move on. And that's it. That's it, folks. It's like a building ministry. It's a ministry to the church. Mm. Now, now, for some people, mm. the title of a pastor is not enough, so it needs to be a bishop. And then if the titles of a bishop's not enough, it needs to be an apostle. Yeah. And I wonder if it's Archangel that's coming next. <laughs> And, and the whole thinking is, the idea is that now in these last days, God is raising up the apostles at the top like a pope. And the prophet, and, and the prophet hears everything from God. There's nobody else, of course. And the prophet has to tell the apostle all the new strategies of how they're going to establish the kingdom in the world and everything else and take dominion. And then the apostle, with all the pastors and all the other churches under his lead, okay, the apostle, or her lead, gives the instructions. That's what we've made of apostle. It's, like, it's, it's, it's almost like, we're, we're, you know, we don't agree with your structures, but we're going to set up this structure over here with the Pope, yeah. which will be an, uh, an apostle, which is, in effect, a Pope. Okay? You can see how, how I get wound up with things like this, because I think it's completely wrong. Yes. And we have to distinguish between those first apostles of Christ. There were certain criteria. They had to be eyewitnesses of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, folks, to be an apostle in that sense of the word. Okay. So the idea that, that God is restoring apostles like those original 12 apostles is just, for me, it's ridiculous. And it's people who are on ego trips. A lot of them are self-appointed. Amen. Deb's with milk. Self-appointed and it's damaging because it becomes controlling. It makes people think, you know, they're in a place that nobody else can. It's ridiculous. Anyway. No, take that off. Praise God. So, simply, simply put, apostles means a saint one. Like a mission, a missionary can be in a saint. In that, in that world, that's what it could mean. A missionary could be an apostle. It's apostles. You've been sent out by the church. To do a work, it doesn't have to carry all the, you know, all the stuff that we've attached to it in these days, anyway. Okay, is everybody clear with that? Yeah. So, moving on to the end, I've read it. So we'll just the doxology, the final doxology. Paul views Christ. Now let's read it again because it's big. Benediction, verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. I wish I could finish, you know, letters like that one. <laughs> it comes flowing out. Isn't it? Anyway. In all things, God wants to, or Paul wants to glorify God. He wants to glorify God. And that's what he does at the end of the letter. Obviously, he's dictating the letter. Okay? We've got the guy who wrote it for him, Tertius. Okay? Who wrote this epistle, so Paul's dictating, Tertius is writing. Paul views Christ as the one who inaugurates the new and decisive age in the history of God's dealings with his people. He says, uh, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. This, this, this mystery of Christ crucified, this is the gospel, 
Christ crucified and resurrected. That's the gospel, right? That's the good news. That is something that, that people in times past just couldn't grasp. There was no place for a crucified Messiah in, 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 in your average Jewish understanding, okay? There was no place for that, but, okay? Everything was different. The way God had done things was different, unexpected. It had been kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. He said the purpose of this revelation is that all nations might believe and obey. Just somebody open the Bible in Romans 1 verse 5. Romans 1 verse 5. First one to do can just read it out loud. For if he would receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Okay, all the Gentiles. When you got anything different? Yeah. Go on. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience in, to the faith among all nations for his name. Amen. Amen. So it's a message for all nations, all the Gentiles, or as a Jew would say, all the Goyim. The Goyim are the nations who are non-Jewish. Okay, which again shows you, man, it's something revolutionary. This new gospel, this gospel, the Jewish Messiah, but died for all nations. And all nations are being called into all peoples and people groups. It's the gospel for all people are being called into obedience through faith in Jesus Christ. Praise God. So the deep theology and the practical instructions in this letter have, their, have as their ultimate goal the glory of God. And it all brings glory to God. God is glorified as we seek to understand that theology and live out its consequences. Amen. So as you are reading and you are seeking and, and you know, you're inquiring of the scriptures and you're praying and seeking the knowledge of the Lord and so on, that glorifies God. That glorifies Him. Bless the Lord. You know, because we don't just seek the knowledge, do we? We're not, it's not just all about gain and intellect. You know, it's, it's, it actually changes the way that you live. That glorifies God. It glorifies God when we put this into practice. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Brianna said something like that this morning. Mm. You know, that when we, when we read the scriptures and seek and go deep in them. Yeah, yeah. And what that does for the Lord, you know. It's yeah. so joyful. You can imagine, you show an interest, you want to, yeah. you want to get to know him, you know, you're not doing this just to fill your head full of knowledge. Yeah. You, you want to under, you want to know him as much as it's possible to know him in this life. As it's been revealed through scripture, as the spirit of God leads us. You want that, don't you? Yeah. You seek that, and that surely pleases God. Yeah. He glorifies him. Amen. And that, folks, brings us to the very end of Paul's letter to the Romans. Isn't that good? Well done. You survived all the way through. Wow. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. And some of you have been really, you've been coming from the start. I mean, you haven't missed many. Do you know what I mean? So, we've covered a lot of ground. Some of the things that we've covered... So a review of the themes of Romans, there's a lot more we could say, but <clears throat> we talked about humanity's sin right at the beginning. Remember Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to the end of the chapter. Yeah. Humanity's sin and God's wrath. And I always said, you know, if you don't understand the bad news, you won't understand the good news. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of water in it down today. There's a lot of people who can't cope with the idea that, that, that God... You know, he's, 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 he's holy and just to the point where he'll, he will pour out his wrath, and he will. And he has to. He has to because he's a just judge as well as a loving father. But it's there, it's in black and white, you can just read it. It makes it very clear that God's wrath is being revealed, you know, against all of the hum uh, rebellion and sinfulness of, of humanity. And it will culminate at the end. As we read the book of Revelation, you'll see the judgments that are coming out on the earth, unfortunately. So we, we see that he, he kind of, he makes an indictment against all of humanity. And this is Paul the Jew. 
a Jewish Christian now, of course, but he puts Jews and Gentiles on a level, level, level playing field, if you like. The Jews, they're guilty with the law, the law of Moses. The Gentiles are guilty without the law of Moses, but they've got the moral law on their own hearts and conscience that God's given. Amen. So everybody's guilty. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says. And that's what it comes to. So remember I told you, he puts that, when you go into a jewellery shop and you have to see diamonds, because that's what you're doing, isn't it? <laughs> I see diamonds, and then they usually they'll put like a dark cloth down as a backdrop first. And then they'll put the diamonds out. Because the diamonds shine brighter against the, the, the dark surface. Yeah? So that's what Paul does in his letter. He tells us the problem first, and then everybody's, you know, guilty. And then he comes with a wonderful message of justification by faith from chapter 3 through to chapter 5. It's always been like that. He says that. He points out to the Old Testament. He points to, to Abraham. He points to David. And he makes it clear it's all justification has always been by faith. It's not something new. It's always been by faith. You understand? It's not that God justified people by the law in the Old Testament and by faith in the New. No, it's always been by faith. You know, faith was there before the law even existed. You know? And so that principle has been the same always. The way that you demonstrated your faith has changed over the years. You know, if you were... Uh, an Israelite during the desert in the desert with your tabernacle, okay, then you would demonstrate your faith by obeying all of the rituals that were given to you. You'd go and take your, your sacrifices and so on, but you'd still be demonstrating your faith through that way. You understand? Mm -hmm. Of course, before that, before that all existed, there was different that they didn't have that knowledge, that understanding, so they would demonstrate their faith through their obedience in other ways. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. but it's always been justification by faith. Then we went on to talk about sanctification, the Christian life. How does this work out? What we, you know, how do we live this out? And we learned that even though we might have the will, we realise that in and of ourselves, we don't have the way. We don't have the way. And Paul actually talks about that in Romans 7 and 8. He's talking about life under the law. Like, you know, he got the, got the will to do something, but he couldn't find the, the power to do it. Got one to do the right things, but soon realised there was another law at work within his members that were dragging him off to do the wrong things. You understand? And then he talks about how do we get free from that? Well, he talks about life in the spirit in Romans chapter 8, which eventually it culminates in, in the glorified body. One day you will receive a glorified body where there will be no more sin. Okay, so we always say salvation has got three uh, aspects to it. Okay, a past, the present, and the future. You have been saved from the penalty of sin by cross, the cross of Christ. You are being saved from the power of sin. You're experiencing that, and you will be saved from the presence of sin. When you're resurrected and there's no more sin to deal with. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the completed work of God, the cross and the resurrection. <clears throat> Alright, so that led us into Romans chapter 9. That really difficult passage of scripture, 9 to 11, where we talked about God and Israel. And Paul starts to talk about, you know, well, has God finished with Israel? The majority of the Israelites have not believed. So what about his promises to Israel? And then Paul starts to explain, well, actually, you know, he's kept a remnant. This, the, the, the promises for the nation are alive because there's a remnant of them alive. And he explains how that remnant has come about. And he explains what will happen, you know, the, the, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then all Israel will be saved. And we talked about that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. There'll come a day, and I would suggest to you that's the day when Christ returns to Jerusalem, that all Israel will be saved at that particular time. That generation, that number, that group that represents Israel at that time will be saved. There will be a turning. Okay, so that was Romans 9 to 11. And then finally we looked at the challenge of maintaining unity in the church between Jews and Gentiles. They were having some challenges in Rome. You know, there were certain people who, 
like we read, that they're very, they were Jewish Christians, obviously, they wouldn't eat certain foods, they wanted to keep certain days and festivals as holy and so on. And the Gentiles were like, what are you all about? You know, we've been set free from all that rubbish. Come on. And then Paul's like, hang on a minute, you know. You who are strong in faith, you must not you must not look down or despise those who are weaker in faith. He actually says they're weaker in faith. But he says, don't despise them. You know, you've got to let them have their own walk. And you who are weaker in faith, you need to stop judging those who were a bit stronger in faith and feel free to do different things. Mm -hmm. And we said that wasn't sin. It's not licensed to sin. It's a completely different subject. All right? But, but observing certain days as festivals, not eating certain foods because there was a chance they'd been sacrificed in the marketplace, you know, that there was feet, uh, meat from a sacrifice. Okay. And that, friends, is, those were the, basically the themes that we looked at. So... Our vision is to be a worshipping community at the heart of Kings Winford. Where every home is an expression of the Kingdom. And every believer a disciple of the King. Our mission is to be obedient to the Great Commission. Through the faithful proclamation of the Gospel. Developing, equipping, and sending of disciples. Welcome to King's Winford Christian Centre.